Hello, everyone. You're watching Stay at Home Cinema, brought to you by TIFF and Crave. We're streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and at tiff.net slash stay at home. We'll also be taking your questions tonight for our converse, during our conversation, so get ready for that. My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the artistic director and co-head of TIFF, and thank you for joining us. Tonight, we're watching Slumdog Millionaire, starting at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and in a few minutes, I'll be joined by the director, Danny Boyle. Shoutouts before we start. Speaking to you from Indigenous land, I want to shout out all Indigenous storytellers and their communities from coast to coast to coast. Uh, we want to thank all levels of government uh, who support TIFF and Canadians, uh, especially right now. Government of Canada, the, the province of Ontario, and the city of Toronto are all supporters of TIFF. We want to thank all frontline workers who are working to keep us safe and healthy and fed. A shout out uh, tonight, a special shout out to South Riverdale Community Health Center, which is one of our longtime community partners and collaborators on TIFF's mental health outreach and peer led film talk series. And a massive shout out to our corporate partners uh, who have supported TIFF for many years in, in um, many cases. Uh, our lead sponsor is Bell. Our major sponsors are RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa. And we wanna thank our donors and our members. Maybe you're one of them. Thank you for supporting us, especially right now. Okay, Shallow Grave, Train Spotting, The Beach, 28 Days Later, 127 Hours, and most recently, Yesterday, Danny Boyle makes iconic films. Big emotion, big ideas, strong, vital direction. These are films that grab people by the heart and, and they make them part of their own identity. But in 2008, there was a new Danny Boyle film that didn't fit any established category. And that was Slumdog Millionaire. I remember I was lucky enough to see that film in a screening room in London that summer. And I was just blown away. We knew we wanted it for the Toronto Film Festival. But the film was in trouble. Its U.S. distributor had just uh, was just about to close up shop. It might not get a new distributor in time. We invited the film. It won our People's Choice Award, and that was the beginning of a long journey through award season where it swept just about every prize, winning eight Academy Awards, including the Best Picture Oscar. And it introduced audiences to Dev Patel, to Frida Pinto, and audiences beyond India to Anil Kapoor and Irfan Khan. So why did Slumdog Millionaire, adapted from the Vika Swarup novel, become the phenomenon it did? How did Danny and his team manage to make this film in the middle of one of the world's biggest, most congested cities? And did he have any idea that this would become the phenomenon and his stars would go on to the careers that they've had? Let's ask him. Welcome to Danny, welcome uh, Danny Boyle to Stay at Home Cinema. Hello, hello everyone. Hello, hey, Cameron. how are you doing? Yeah, very good. Thanks for that yeah. intro, Cameron. That was very hey, sweet. Danny, I'm really glad you're joining us. Look, you're the man who made 28 Days Later, so I have to ask, how is your quarantine going so far? Yeah, lockdown. Um, yeah, it's it's it's, um, it's weird. I go I, I go out on the bike uh, once a day, you know, for my exercise, my Julia Load exercise. And it's a little bit, I live a, near a road called the Mile End Road, which is not a pretty road. It's a very industrial place and it's usually covered in cars. And it looks like the opening of 28 Days Later right now. <laughs> it so it's weird going around, cycling around your own movie set in a way for a bit. Yeah. That's sort of what it feels like. But we've no, just had actually, I was, we've just had the Clap for Carers tonight. We have a weekly Clap for Carers and we have a great turnout there. You see more people at that moment down the street than you see the rest of your day. So it's always a great moment on a Thursday evening. Oh, that's nice. Now, it's been 12 years since uh, Slumdog Millionaire and looking back on that success, can you see the path of it anywhere? Did you see the seeds of what that film would become as you were making it and as you were conceiving it? No, I think that you, you um, no, you you get, I, I realized in, when I look back on it, I was, um, completely immersed or flooded or just invaded by the experience that was India and everything that you can absorb there. I mean, and you only absorb a tiny bit of it, really. And that that really, it was only until we got to Toronto, you know, Telluride and then Toronto. And it was that 
and it was a it was it, it, even even so it even then it was like nerve wracking because of what you mentioned earlier in your intro about you know that the film might not get distribution so it felt very fragile and yet it also felt like the, one of the most extraordinary filmmaking experiences I'd ever had and personal experiences I'd ever had and I still hold that to be true so although I'm hugely grateful the, for the reception it got and overwhelming though all that was it never quite ever overshadowed the experience we had making the film which is a great thing to feel you know that you that the experience of making it is more important than actually what the wonderful things that happened to it you know mm -hmm. i want to ask you about that fox search i did of course pick the film up and it went on to incredible success um, but it mixes fantasy and realism in a really wonderful way there is a happy ending for those who have not seen it before. I, I don't feel like a, that's a bad thing to spoil it because there's some tough uh, parts of it as well. It's a real immersion into slum life in Mumbai. How did you manage that, that the fantasy and the, and the realistic side and, and what responsibility did you feel in, in representing what you were in, in Slumdog? I, I, again, it was the experience. I, I think when you arrive in a city like Mumbai and you start to go to the places where the film is set, you know, when you start to research the film or begin to set up the film uh, you're you're either repelled by the circumstances that people have to live in or you're kind of drawn into it really like they are and i was i found their resilience and their energy was something that just naturally appealed to me i was hugely affectionate about them straight away and this is despite the fact as you see in the film some terrible things clearly are a part of everyday life um mm -hmm. So it was it was it was it was a feeling that you could um, you could go anywhere, really. There's so much there sitting side by side. The rich and the poor live much closer together than in almost any society I've ever seen. And tragedy and triumph live side by side as well. And so these incredible extremes are right in front of you all the time. And for a filmmaker, somebody who's interested in drama, for Simon Balfoy writing the script, for me making it. It's a, it's a gift in terms of drama because mm -hmm. there's so much of it all and you can select what you want from it. And, and the, the natural instinct of the home film um, community there is flamboyant anyway. You know, their love of their... their, their Larger kind of than film. life is life well, in a way. <laughs> so fantasy of different kinds sits very readily. And, and the kids, when we started auditioning, the kids... The kids acted like straight out of the box. And you thought, my God, they're so confident acting. And of course <laughs> they are, because since the age of three, they've been impersonating their film heroes mm -hmm. and doing little dances and copying the steps and things like that. So there's an access to the vibrancy of film in, uh, that's very, very readily available. Not so readily available, not so common, is a depiction, a brutal depiction of some of the circumstances and conditions of life there. And so we try to put those two things together, I suppose. And you're right, the film begins, especially with some pretty tough stuff, and people often forget that approaching the film. But it ends in a kind of romantic fairy tale world, really, in a way, with a dance that everybody loves kind of singing along to you know and our great composer A.R. Rahman he manages to bridge those two worlds as well and and so it's bridging those two worlds that are readily available to you there. Yeah um, you have two remarkable actors who play uh, your leads in in the present day in the film Dev Patel and Frida Pinto I understood that you cast them essentially for the, the kind of the connection the spark they had together what was it about the two of them together that worked? I know. I I um I was. Uh, you you can never. I mean, you ask any filmmaker, and you can never know. And they te they do screen tests together and things like that. But there's no guarantee that it'll ever pay off. Really, you just have to hope that you've cast each part correctly, and that then luck. And luck is a very big uh, feature of Indian philosophy fate luck the way things play out it's a mystery that's very difficult to explain but you understand it when it's happening and one of the things that happened on this film is that all the decisions that we made in terms of like casting for instance worked out i mean they, and, and it almost seemed in a way that we weren't in charge of these things that's a very odd thing to say and it happens to you when you spend time in india you, yes. you, you have to surrender you, you know? know that don't you, you? yeah in front of you. 
And it was a bit like that with the casting. It's sort of like it just fell into place. And a wonderful casting director, lovely in Tandon, and Gail Stevens here in London found Dev Patel. Um, like we didn't find Dev in India. He was the only person we brought from London. We found him in London. But, but not because he was established or anything, just because he seemed like the right person. So you have to hope and pray that that chemistry works. And it did, and it's a beautiful romance to believe in. And, we, and they were initially meant to be much older those particular actors. They were written originally as in the mid twenties, but we went much younger, which was risky, but also good for the sense of innocence that the film really relishes at the end. After all the experiences they've been through, they managed to retain this beauty and love, which is very appealing to, mm -hmm. um, you know, to an audience, I think. Certainly to the Toronto audience, Thank oh you, Toronto. God, yes. <laughs> we loved it. Um, you have some established actors in the movie as well. And I'm thinking especially of Irfan Khan right now, who yeah. just two weeks ago passed away, sadly. Um, and this is a question that I wanted to ask, and also one of our members, uh, Namfanalo Malloy. What are your memories of working with him on Slumda Slumdog Millionaire? He was, um, yeah, it's a very, um, it's a very sad moment to think about him not being with us anymore. Though, of course, the wonderful thing about actors is, of course, they live on in their parts for us in some mm -hmm. way. And and that's a kind of like a compensation or what. Um, he, he, he was, he, it's funny, actually, as soon as we started making the film, I had worked a, a number of times with Peter Rice from Fox Searchlight. What was Fox Searchlight now? They're now Searchlight. Um, and he, he said to me, although he wasn't involved in the film at that stage, his part in the film was fated to come much later. But he did say to me, well, oh, if you're doing a film in India, make sure you get that guy, Irfan Khan. He's very good. Oh. And, he t and, he, and he was really, really like quite, quite not heavy, but quite, quite insistent about it. Really check that guy out. And I think it was because Peter re regarded him that his style of acting was much more accessible for a Western audience than some of the actors that you might. Now, in fact, what we found in, in working with Indian actors is inc they're incredibly flexible. They're natural, what's naturally called upon from them is one particular style, but they also know and love the Western style, if you can call them separate styles. And they're growing closer and closer together and will eventually merge, I imagine, no problem. But anyway, Irfan was a very interior actor. You know, he had an interior life, but he also had a warmth which is beautiful about him. And I think he comes from those sad eyes of his. Those oh my God, eyes. those eyes, yeah. yeah. You kind of lose yourself in them. Yeah, and, and he had this very, not really particularly rewarding part of a guy who just asks a series of questions, really, if you look at it. Mm -hmm. But of course, he's her fan. So he, he gives it such beauty and tenderness. And you sense him grow to like the boy and to begin to lead the audience to lead us all and to lead history through the experiences of this boy, which will lead us to triumph and belief and believing in somebody, even though they appear to be worthless. Mm -hmm. really. Before we get to some more audience questions, there's one more thing I want to ask you about, which is just the visual style of the film, which is really remarkable. You're working with the cinematographer, Anthony Dodd Mantle, using some new technology at the time, I think, as well, in terms of those lightweight uh, cameras. Can you talk, tell us a little bit about just shooting the way you did with that kind of kinetic energy in Dharavi, I think you were in, in the, the slum neighborhood of Mumbai. Yeah, there's a huge slum called Dharavi, um, or Dharavi, there's different ways of pronouncing it, which is an enormous slum of like about 2 million people. And there's a smaller slum called Juhu, which we also used as well. And the camera work was a, re was a, a reaction to how you would ever be able to work in those places and everybody assumed that when we went there that we would build our slum in a studio mm. so you which is of course is absurd but it's a <laughs> business so you have all these slum, That's real really slums where you but you would build one and it would be very hygienic and all this kind of stuff and we we said no we wanted to actually film in the real places with the real people and therefore anthony responded to that by realizing he would have to be very lightweight really and not use traditional film cameras. They're also, um, India is such a, a film literate place that they see they see a camera, they kind of like know what's going on. Mm -hmm. this, it wasn't like it was a computer in a in a rucksack on his back and a tiny little, like 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 literally like that in his hand. Mm -hmm. um, and 
that allowed us to get away with a lot more and to film a lot more real things than you would normally expect. Um, so it came organically, like I realized a lot of the film, like we're talking about casting, you sort of seem to be in control of these decisions, but when you look back on them, you think, no, that's organic. The, mm. the slums where we decided to film dictated Anthony into making these choices. And then we just responded in a way that felt like we had a duty to represent people's lives there in a, with a joy and an exuberance that they wanted. Because they kept saying to us, you're not going to show us we're, that we're poor. That's all they kept mm. saying to us in the slums. Make sure you don't show we're poor, you know. And you thought, well, you're going to look poor. That will come across <laughs> anyway because of the circumstances. But yeah. what we've got to do is make sure the place looks like it has the vibrancy of 10, 10 times the number of people. Even mm. though the number of people is unimaginable, it's got a bigger heart than that even, you know. Mm. Um, so I have some questions from TIFF members and donors. And if, if you're watching right now, you can also, uh, through your comments, send in a, in a question to Danny. So please go ahead and do that. Um, here's one from Lara Bulger, who's a member. And she asks about A.R. Rahman. How did you decide to collaborate with him? And what was that process like? Well, we had these, we had these, we had this Indian production company called Take One. And the guys who ran that said to me, you've got to meet A.R. Rahman. You've got to meet Mr. Rahman. And I'd listened to his stuff. And I, and I, I must admit, I thought at first, one of the key points would be to get a Western composer. In mm. fact, I had this kind of idea that I'd asked Jack White from the White Stripes to do oh, the music. Interesting. And because I thought he needed a Westerner who's going to make it, you know, make the film more accessible in some way. But then I met A.R. And he's just extraordinary. And again, it really is. it's what I said to you, Cameron. These things, these decisions get taken out of your hands. There's something mm. about you just go with it. When you go with it, you realize this will come back to you and give you tenfold what you asked mm. of it. And that's what I found with him. Wonderful collaborator. It was a joy for him to be able to work with a different bunch of people. He's, mm. a, he's called the Mozart of Madras. Chennai it's now called but you know he's so he's a superstar in his own world oh, but he yeah. wanted to reach across to our world as well and won an Oscar he won two I think I think he, he won two. and, and he, he won one of them by competing against himself because he got nominated with uh, MIA for one of the other songs anyway oh, yeah. it was it was amazing and he's the first Indian to win an Oscar which is a moment of huge pride for him and for the country yeah Mm -hmm. um, here's one from Jonathan Chiasson, who's a Contributor Circle TIFF member. What was Lovely and Tanda's contribution as co-director of the film and, and uh, on the casting side as well? And how did that collaboration go? She was, there were three people who, again, like one of the key devices of the film is the three musketeers who were a, a key question. And there were three of us making the film. There was myself, the producer, Christian Colson, and Simon Balfour, the writer. There were also, mm -hmm. I call, three musketeers amongst the Indian crew. There was Loveleen, who I'll come on mm -hmm. and talk about, Rasul, who was our sound uh, recordist, and mm -hmm. Raj, who was my first assistant director. And mm -hmm. they were the three geniuses who opened up the local world to me and who guided my every step in terms of not offending people, mm -hmm. knowing how to get the best out of a circumstance or a situation. Um, and Loveleen was our first point of contact, really, as a casting director to find the kids. Mm -hmm. And then she became more involved in the day to day with the young, very young children. And so we gave her a co-directing credit, which isn't really a it, she didn't really direct the film as such. But it felt like it would be a way to reflect in the credits how important she was to me as a mm -hmm. as a collaborator. Yeah. Right. Um, here's a question that's just come in via Facebook from Tanya Green. One thing I noticed in the Danny Boyle films I've seen is that they all seem to have one big song, one big moment that resonates with the audience. Is music a personal interest for you? Oh, it's huge. I, <laughs> if you cut me, I bleed music really rather than <laughs> films. I just listen to music all the time. And one of the tragedies of getting older is that you lose that automatic contact you have with music you know when you're mm. like in your 20s and 30s and 40s even yeah. you just kind of just you just know what's going on i mean it just doesn't there's no particular passage where you find it through you just know and then mm -hmm. it fades a little bit and i do it more vicariously through my kids at the moment but yeah i'm a huge music fan and i feel it's a very big emotional part of your experience of a film and i love 
making those connections as filmmakers from Scorsese onwards have done with mm. contemporary music is a big thing for me, yeah. Yeah. Here's one from um, Ethan Stam, uh, who just asked, you know, with all of your success, what is your advice for young filmmakers? You just got to be um, persistent. Hmm. I mean, that's the one thing more than more than ambition and talent. They often say, what's the most important, ambition or talent? It, persistence is more important than anything. You hope you have a bit of um, a bit of ambition, a bit of talent, but persistence is everything. Find your peer group. It's always easy to look up to people who are older than you, who are successful, and think that they will pass on something to you. That's an illusion, I think. Mm. You can learn things from them, but they won't pass on anything to you. You will do it yourself with your peer group. By your peer group, I mean your contemporaries. Mm -hmm. Find people whose voices you're interested in working with, whichever level you're working at, the people you like to work with. And if you can work with them, do that. Don't be frightened of telling people how good they are, you know, because we all need that kind of like encouragement sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then you'll find ways of telling them when they're, when they're not so good, <laughs> you'll find their own way around about doing that, which is also important, but um, encouragement is very important as well. That's great advice, Danny. The last thing I want to ask, Deb Patel has really grown into quite a strapping young leading man as well Ooh. now. Um, and I guess a lot of people want to know, will you uh, work with Deb Patel again? I'd love to. I mean, if you can get hold of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's 30. I saw his 30th birthday. Wow. Came up the other day. So he's 30 now. He was like, but when we made the film, he was like 19, I think. Mm. And it was one of the most extraordinary things I remember is how on set he was not intimidated by me. I was expecting, because I'd made quite a few films, mm -hmm. I I've made train spotting and all this kind of stuff. I thought, <laughs> yeah, you'll be in awe of me. But he was genuinely yeah. like a lead actor should be. Huh. He wasn't. He wasn't just going to take be told what to do. He wanted to know why, the how, you know, all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So he had a resilience in him that's you sense in the part of Jamal as well in that role as well. And he gave a wonderful central performance um, that you can balance the whole film on. You know, all the extremities of the film are balanced on this young man whose face, beautiful, quite solemn face, you keep cutting back to. You know, that's the that's the centre, the absolute centre of the film. Yeah, I'd work with him again like a shot. But yeah. whether, he'd, whether he'd be available, Cameron, I don't know. <laughs> He's a very it's busy man. <laughs> Danny, thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's late where you are. It's now after midnight. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. And we are about to start. We're about to start Slumdog Millionaire in Canada. We're watching on Crave. So we're going to press play at 7.30 p.m. That's in about seven or eight minutes. Uh, 4.30 p.m. on the West Coast. And if you're going to watch in the UK, it's late at night. Uh, <laughs> watch wherever you can. If you've got some Indian snacks, even better. Watch along with us. We're going to be live tweeting using hashtag TIFF at home. Danny Boyle, thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.